talk to you about the evil day. Uh, but before I do, let me just ask for the Lord's direction. Father, Father, you know more than I do where, where this will go, this message, these words. But Father, I pray that we would be reminded and refreshed anew in your wonderful truth. Lord, your word will never return void, and it never gets old or redundant. It, Lord, it, let it settle on the heart like that new, fresh morning dew. Lord, like that mercy that is new every morning. And Lord, it's not wasted on your children. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for it. So I ask that you would give us attentive minds and receptive hearts, Lord, and I pray that you would communicate your truth through this broken vessel, these lips of clay, and hide me again in the shadow of the cross, and only Jesus is exalted in this place. And Lord, again, we pray for healing too. May people sense your healing touch. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6 for just a few moments, and we're going to move around a little bit. Ephesians chapter 6, I want to just give you the first verse I want to look at, and we're going to talk about that for a moment and then um, move on. So verse 12, 6, 12, Ephesians. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the forces of evil in the heavenly places. You know, there's a lot of things going on in that one verse that pertain to the dark side, you might say. There's rulers, there's authorities, there's cosmic powers, and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And I thank God that we are shielded, shielded from that, that we cannot see all that is going on in the spiritual realm with that. We would be horrified. We might say and, that our times are no different than any other time in the history of man. We have heard it said and we have said it as well. We are living in the last days and we are. We are in the last days. And, and we've been in the last days since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And these days are evil. These days are evil. This week we have been reminded of the evil in our world. First thing I thought of, I'm sure maybe some of you did as well, is man, this is just pure evil that is going on. Here in Maine, the enemy was allowed to steal, kill, and destroy. We find that in John 10. That's what he's come to do. Creating a, creating a tragedy of unprecedented proportions in our state. And it will take a long time to heal from this, when you, especially when you think of the families that have been involved. Um, I, I, can't, I really can't imagine what they're suffering, that those who lost loved ones in this. And, and for the family of the suspect, the, the one who did this, they too are suffering. And I'm glad that that was mentioned the other night in the conference that was held at 10 o'clock, 10.30. Families have been shattered and lives are changed forever. And sadly, sadly now, and this is the only time I'm going to go in this direction, there are those who will use this darkness to create many paths of judicial and legislative politics, which will in turn now, and this is, this is where we need to pay attention to that, which will in turn keep many people blinded from what did and is happening in our world, not only here in the state of Maine. What happened a few days ago is a very sad reminder of the, the evil in our world. And there is evil. Yes, there is evil in our world, and the days are evil. This day is evil. Now, e even on the best sunny day, yesterday it was a beautiful day, wasn't it? Too hot for deer hunting, really. It was a beautiful day. And we say, oh, thank you, Lord, for this day, but that day is evil. In that spiritual sense, the day is evil. Um, we live in a fallen world, and it is in darkness. This world literally is in darkness. 
Evil is rooted in and represents and operates in darkness. The church, however, operates in the light and life of Jesus Christ. That's the good news. The events of this week is a reminder that the church of Jesus Christ is to remain vigilant, watchful, prayerful, in the word. For the time of Christ's return is closer now than at any other time in history. Now, now let, me, let me footnote that by saying this. Just because it's hit home doesn't mean it's an international threat. And just because it's happening in our lives, in our neighbors' lives, doesn't mean that the second coming is happening right now. We often do that, don't we? We plead for God's mercy and grace and to prepare, prepare our hearts. You know, Christ could return today. He could have returned yesterday. He could return 100 years from now, but we are to remain vigilant and watchful. And, and with this that's happened, may we as a church, the church as a whole, Take these things to the Lord in prayer, praying for people every day, people we don't even know. We should be praying for them. We should be praying for the saved and the unsaved, the rich and the poor. Everyone we should be praying for, that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. Though there is evil in our world, the Christian, however, is not to become fearful of this evil, but we are to live in the hope by which we have been set free in Jesus Christ. And For Jesus has overcome the world, inclusive of the evil one as well. Jesus would have us to live in his peace, and in, the un in this unsettled world, in this darkened world, yet Jesus says to us, we have his peace. He would give us his peace. In John 16, Jesus said that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. In other words, be cheerful. Rejoice in him because he's overcome the world. Maybe you're thinking, no, evil overcame the other night. No. No. Evil did not overcome the world. Christ has overcome the world. Remember, we do live in a fallen world. We live in a world under darkness. The days are evil. Four things I want to just cover here in a few moments. The days are evil. Ephesians 5. Just flip over to one chapter. I want us to look at, we're going to just start at verse 1. I'm going to do a quick run through here. Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, verse 1, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Then he, now Paul is going to deal with some issues here. He says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. What a difference we are to, to bring to this world, huh? Let there be thanksgiving, he says. For you may be sure of this. You may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. They're not going to make heaven. Period. Remember, the gate is narrow and the way is straight. And the Bible says there, there are few who find it. Actually, Luke says there are, there, are, there are many trying to get in and they won't. Interesting. They have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. Now, how, how urgent is it then for the church to remain pure and holy? Huh? Very, very urgent for the church to remain pure and holy. God does care about how you live. God cares about how you conduct yourself, what your behavior is like. As a matter of fact, he tells us to, that our conduct and our behavior should be holy because he's holy. The, the full depth of all that we will ever be in Jesus Christ is summed up in one word, holy. Holy. You want to experience the deeper things of God? Be holy. Plain and simple, isn't it? Verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. 
Therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Isn't that great? We are, we are children of light living in a dark world. Living in a very dark world. And yet we stand out as light in the world. Salt and light in this world. To reflect Christ, to be the image bearers of Christ in this dark time, this dark world. You know, we, we've experienced, we've, we've seen this impact of what unfolded the other day, but we don't know that that couldn't happen again today or tomorrow. God knows. God wasn't blindsided with this whole thing either. He knew. He actually had to allow it. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take that to heart. Every day, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord in my conduct, in my thoughts, in my actions, my conversations. Am I pleasing to the Lord? I would like to stand here as your spiritual leader and pastor and say, yes, I'm always pleasing to the Lord. But I'm not. I'm not. And I know that may make some of you feel very comfortable. <laughs> but we should be praying that. Lord, I want to please you today. I want to please you in my conversations. I want to please you in my attitude, in my thought life, that nobody else knows about, just you. My thoughts. Hmm. Verse 11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Now, now, this is something for us to consider here. As a Christian, we have been born again. We have been forgiven of all our sins. We have been cleansed by the blood of Christ from everything filthy and vile that has separated us from, from God the Father. And Christ has reconciled us to the Father through his blood, through his cross. Why would Christians go and partake in the unfruitful works of darkness. Why? You know, church, is coming a day of reckoning for the church. Why? Why would we engage then ourselves in the works of darkness, the unfruitful works of darkness? And you know, I'm talking about anything from really big, a big deal right down to our attitudes are backbiting. Yep, there we go. I heard everyone move their feet out of my way on that one. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of those things that they do in secret. You know, the sinners do things in secret. Those who try to hide from God do things in secret. The light and life of Christ in us is called to do one thing, and that is to expose. First in us. First in us. Expose in us, Lord, every error. Try me and know my thoughts. Search me and know me. Try me and see if there be what? Any grievous or wicked way in me, and then lead me in the way everlasting. That's in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know me. We live in an evil day. We need to be careful of that as Christians that we're not partaken of the evil of this day. We come to church on Sunday and have communion with one another and most importantly with God. And then we go out we want to associate with the communion and fellowship of the world. And some of the things we see, read, or do, or talk about. There's coming a day of reckoning. That's a warning to us, to me, to you, to all of us. God knows where we are. He knows where you are. Verse 14, 13, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Uh, and these are the next two verses are the ones I really wanted us to see. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 
You know, we are to pay attention. The word careful directs us to pay specific attention. Be alert to how we walk. Why? Because the way we walk is what we represent as Christians. And that is the King of glory. We represent Him. We are Christ's ambassadors to the world around us. Your world, wherever you are. Your neighbors, your work, whatever. We must be careful and pay specific attention in how we represent Christ. And we go right back to verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Being careful how we walk is to imitate God, imitate Christ, and to love, sacrificially love. You know, we, we, we're funny people. That's why we're called sheep. You know, you never know what a sheep is going to do, right? Just when you think they've got it, they're going to repeat the old pattern. So God refers to us as sheep. We'll stroll out, we'll keep eating and wander ourselves right out into the desert. Nobody around and we don't even notice we're all alone. We just keep eating and wandering until the shepherd comes and brings us back. You know, um, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Hmm. We are to take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but we are rather to expose them. Christ is light, and you are in Christ. Light has nothing to do with darkness, but is to expose the evil deeds of darkness. The Christian is to be watchful in our walk. As 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion, lion seeking someone to devour. Not seeking someone to just scratch here. Or to rough up a little bit. As people say, well, boy, I've really had a hard week. Satan's been after me. No, he isn't, because you're still breathing. He's out to devour you. He's not just going to tumble you. He's going to devour you. We are to know the schemes of the enemy. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 4, it says, For even Satan disguised himself as an angel of light, so it is no surprise that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Hmm. Take that to the bank. I'll tell you. You know, so we need to be careful of the schemes of the enemy. And Paul says we're not ignorant of the schemes of the enemy. That's how, when, when we know the word, because we know Christ, we are to know the word, and we are to be aware and to know the schemes of the enemy. We are to be able to discern that in a moment. This is the work of the enemy right here. And not just the big things, but even in the little things, the little subtle things we are to recognize as of the enemy. You hang around people that are always negative? That's the work of the enemy. Christians shouldn't be negative. Christians shouldn't talk down on other people. We are called to laborly encourage one another unto love and good works, are we not? Yeah, we are. To encourage one another unto love and good works. Why? Because the days are evil and the person sitting next to you, in front of you, or behind you could fall into trouble spiritually. And we need each other to encourage one another in Christ. We have to know the schemes of the enemy. Scripture teaches us that those who are caught up in the evil of our day, it will get worse. Our sister read it this morning from 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. Answer. While evil people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You know, I've, I've heard people say before um, concerning people and why they do not come to Christ. They're intelligent people. They're practical people. Why would they not come to Christ? Because that, that dissolves faith. Intellect dissolves faith. Because in the intellectual mind, they need answers up front. They need practicality. They need a standard and directive. The Word of God tells us we are saved by grace through faith. Faith, right? And so if I bring my intellect to it, I don't need Jesus. All I need, all I need is the Bible, and I'll figure it out. It's never going to happen. Never going to happen. People need to be brought through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to understand their great need of a Savior. And that dismisses intellect. Now, we aren't to check our brains out at the door. Don't, don't get me wrong. 
Don't check your brains out at the door. God wants to use your mind. He really does for his glory. But we can never figure out salvation in our mind. Of all the ascendant academias in our time and in our day, nothing will touch heaven. Ever will it touch heaven. Hmm. Second thing I want us to look at is there is demonic activity in our world today as it was in the days of Christ. What we witnessed just days ago was, I believe, of demonic possession and influence. And I stand on that. I want to share something with you. About a week and a half ago, long before this happened, I received an email from an individual. And this, e this individual contacts me every so often with questions. And they ask concerning demonic activity and possession. Imagine that. Huh? They ask me, do you believe there is a biblical, that there is biblical evidence of demonic activity of this kind even being possible? And they were referring to, their question was centered around the de demoniac of Gadarene that we find in Mark chapter 5 and verse 1 we'll look at in a moment. And with movies such as The Exorcist and The Conjuring. Because they've seen them. Is there? There is demonic activity. How did I answer this individual? I said, absolutely, there's demonic activity. Aside from Hollywood application, there is demonic activity. And there is demon possession in our day. Probably more so in our day than there was in Jesus' day because there's so many more people. And I would go so far as to say, oftentimes, the, 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 the possession, the demonic possession hides itself through medical exams and prognosis. Sometimes, not all times, but sometimes. Turn with me back to Mark chapter 5. And you know, <laughs> this is the craziness of our day. I really wanted to apologize for what I was about to say there because some people will take it the wrong way. But I don't apologize for that because the church, had, church stands on the word of truth. We live by a biblical and spiritual standard and we're accountable to that. You know, the enemy is subtle, he's evil, and he's a coward, and he hides behind people. And poor people suffer at his hand. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus and his disciples had come to the Gerasenes, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, verse 1. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Pitiful individual, isn't he? Think about it. Well, you know, someone should put him out of his misery. Really? You, you, you know, you may think that that's crazy. I've heard stuff like that from Christians this week. And I mean, I'm appalled by it, by the way. Very. Verse 6, and when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. How could he do that? How could he adjure Christ? It was the man speaking here as well, and the demons speaking through him, not wanting to go back from where he came from. I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. So they were sent back. 
You think, well, this is quite a story. It would make good, a good movie. That's real. This is real stuff, isn't it? We don't see it on this scale, however, because the church has become a little callous to these things. A little, you might say, lackadaisical on, in these areas of truth. In verse 14, the herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what, what, was, what was that had happened, what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They're still afraid? <laughs> they were afraid of this guy when he was demon-possessed. Now they're afraid because he's been healed. Because they are recognizing that there was a greater power. There was a greater power involved here. There was a greater presence there now that even demons have to obey. He was clothed and in his right mind. Isn't that what God does? Huh? This poor pathetic man was tormented day and night, screaming and crying and injuring himself. And Jesus comes along and, along and speaks a word and instantly he was made whole. Man, and he wanted to tell the world about it. He wanted to tell the world about it. Verse 16, and those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Cultures have begged Jesus to depart from their region too. United States has begged Jesus to depart from our culture. If not, we'll remove you. <laughs> Verse 18, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed, possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. Can you see this? Can you see this poor guy? He's so, he is so in love with Jesus that he, he's made whole. I want to go with you. He was getting in the boat. Man, he was going to be the shadow of Jesus from that day on. He wanted to go with Jesus. He had been touched by Jesus. He wanted to be near Jesus. It was a safe zone for him. He didn't know that he was going to be safe from that moment on. What did Jesus say to him? He begged him that he might be with him. He begged Jesus. And he said, and he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has mercy on you. <laughs> and he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. Man, this guy, can you imagine? He, he couldn't wait now to tell people about what Jesus had done for him. Church kind of pales in light of that, don't we? Well, I, I, you know, I wasn't delivered of any demons or any possessions like that, and I certainly don't have the story this dude has. Boy, have we missed it, if that's the way we think. Well, I've been serving God for so long, you know, leave it to the young folks to do that. You know, you need a fire underneath you, and I would love to set that fire. <laughs> this guy went out and he began to tell everybody of what Jesus had done for him. Jesus said, proclaim what has happened to you and the mercy that you have received. You and I have received mercy. We have the same testimony as this guy. I was lost, I have been found. I was blind and now I see I have been delivered of my sin and cleansed by Jesus Christ and he's healed me. I've received his mercy. Good night, tell the world about it. Tell the world about it. You know, some of the most difficult people we'll, we will always witness to when we encounter them are family, the ones closest to us. You know? And it is difficult, isn't it? Because they know you. Jesus had a very difficult time in his hometown. As a matter of fact, he had to leave because they didn't believe him. They, they thought they knew him. Hmm. Let me give you this third one and I'll close. Our day is evil. There is demonic possession and oppression in our day. 
and the things, the evil's going to get worse and worse. You know, stop thinking, okay, as a Christian, that we're going to reach a some, somehow earthly and fleshly utopia. We're not. Boom. Just blew your bubble. We're not. Things are going to get worse. You know, it's like the, the old song says, and I really don't know it that well. I just know this one line. Reagan used it. You haven't seen anything yet. You haven't seen anything yet. And I don't say that to scare you. I say that to prepare you. You know, what we saw happen a few days ago was a lot of death. And you know, one thing about death, it clarifies life, doesn't it? It really clarifies life for us. Is it this physical life? Many will focus on that. But Jesus says, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. And that's where we need it. The world needs that clarification on eternal life. And that can only be found in Jesus Christ. You know how many people in that, that area who have been hurt, how many of those people were run into all the wrong places to find comfort and hope when it is only in Jesus Christ? And, and you know, it's not their fault. It's not their fault. You know, they were running in fear. And we should, we should be moved by that because we have the answer for security. We have the answer for security. Third, when, when will this all end? You ever wonder that? Lord, when's this all going to end? Our hope is in Jesus Christ and in his second coming. In Matthew... Chapter 24, if you want to turn with me, and I'll make this brief. Jesus is talking about several things here. In, in one sense, he's talking about the, the fall of Jerusalem, and then he changes gears and he talks about the second coming, when he will return. In Matthew 24, verse 36, because he was asked a question. And he says, but concerning, verse 36 of Matthew 24, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. There is going to be such a delusion in the world of our time, like the days of Noah. People are just going to keep doing their normality right up till the very end. Thinking nothing of it. Nothing of it. What were the days of Noah like? People were marrying, eating and drinking, and giving in marriage. And this was their day-to-day -day normality. They were doing the things that people of today do, right? And why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? We go into a normality pattern, and that's where we stay. We work, we love our families, we, we live, we sleep, and we get old. Everything is the same as it always has been, they might say. The only thing different in their day is they, they might say, Oh, except for this guy Noah over there building this humongous ark that we know nothing about, you know. Genesis 3, 5 tells us that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. And that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So in the days of Noah, there was an increase in corruption on the earth. I, I would say that's what's going on in our day, too. There's an increase of corruption in this world today. As a matter of fact, to compound what is being said here, God adds to his description of Noah's day by saying in Genesis 6.11, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. God has a tolerance level. God has a limit that he's going to allow these things to happen. And then there's going to come a stop to it. God has a rescue plan engaged for his church, for his people, for his people. 
And that is to bring them out and to deliver them and bring us to His eternity. New heavens and a new earth where we will be with Him forever. And there won't even be a, a, a word of evil in God's eternity. Nothing, nothing. We pray, Thy kingdom come and Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will is consistently done in heaven with no interruptions, period. God's will is done on earth, but with many interruptions. Disobedience and whatnot. And so we find that God will, God's going to step in. God's going to step in to this world's situation and to all that's going on in the evil day. God knows how to deliver the just, doesn't he? God knows how to deliver the just. God knows how to deliver his people. And the day is coming, church. The day is coming. Don't lose hope. Don't lose sight of that. Don't, don't, don't lose that, that passion for that. Get reignited in that. Rekindled in that truth. Christ is coming. And before I close, I, I want to clear one thing up. I do believe that that was of demonic possession and influence. But let's not give too much credit to Satan either. The Bible tells us concerning the heart of man. It is wicked, desperately sick. Who can know it? God. God can know it. And when a person is given over to the corruption of their own heart, they open themselves up for so many things in the spiritual realm. You know, when I, I see... These young people playing around with the occult, Ouija boards and different things like that, and they think it's all a game? Are you kidding me? This is, this is evil stuff. And Satan's just looking for an opportunity, an open door. We live in an evil day, but we live in the light and life of Jesus Christ, which makes it a glorious day. Therefore, we can say, say as the song says, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. And I will enter his courts with praise. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. In the evil day, Christ has overcome for his church. Huh? And we have victory.